Well, welcome to Dorset Shoals Wednesday Night Live. My name is Pastor Steve Smith. Well, my name's not Pastor Steve Smith. I'm Steve Smith, and I'm the pastor here at Dorset Shoals Baptist Church. And I want to just continue walking through a lesson set that we started last week. This is Mama Bear Apologetics, and this is a really interesting read that I received from a friend of mine who talked about the, the neat things that this book talked about as it goes into culture and all the things surrounding what goes on in our cultures today. And as the title implies, it's as a mama bear, how a mama bear is going to protect her children from the things that are going on in our world. And so we're going to pick up on this week as we start into the second week talking about some of the things that this lesson, these books have taught us. And the big thing I want to kind of start off with here as we get into is, is why the importance of doing this. Well, as Christians, we are going to be a part of culture. Now, yes, we are to be separate. We are to you know, make sure that we are living lives differently, that we have a different viewpoint on a lot of different things, a different worldview, which is something we talked about last week. But we are still going to be exposed to culture. We're going to still be a part of the culture. You know, because if we just took ourselves out of the culture altogether, then the culture is doomed because no one's going to be able to tell them what is going on. No one's going to be able to tell them the truth of what is their need for their salvation. And so that's the whole point of this. This is not to tell our children to fear culture and stay away from it, but how to engage in it in a proper way, to see how culture is going to try to change their viewpoints and how they can respond to that. So I think it's very important for us to look at this and to see what it's talking about. So as we jump into today, one of the things that the book points out and talks about a lot is something called ideological captivity. Now, when we see ideological captivity, I think we can see this kind of highlighted in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, when it says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. All right, so you see kind of in that scripture right there that this is something that's been going on for a long time. That people are going to try to use their own thoughts, they're going to use their own traditions, their own ideologies, uh, and trying to trip people up, especially people of faith. So you look at this, say this is something we need to teach our children about, and it's not just about protection or, uh, I hate to say it this way, arming them to be able to uh, fight against this, but also to see the person who is that ideological captive, not in a negative light, but in a light of, hey, that person needs help. Because what is ideological captivity? Well, ideological captivity is really kind of something where people who will defy logic to hold their position. You know, we're very polarized in our world today, and people will sometimes defy absolute logic to hold to that opinion. You know, a couple that I've put down here, um, you know, the abortion for any reason. You know, most people are very, well, I shouldn't say reasonable. Most people look at things and say, okay, yes, I might hold this position, but there's certain parts of my position that I would not agree with. But you're seeing now more and more people who, you know, abortion for any reason, and I will accept abortion for any reason, no matter what. You know, this is where you get the people who are ideological captives who say, well, if the mother doesn't want that baby, even if it's born alive, it should just be left on the table to die. That is horrible. And it's very easy for us to look and just say, that person's a monster. But they're an ideological captive. Because they're saying, well, I agree with abortion, or I'm pro-choice. I saw a video yesterday where uh, a lady confronted a man who would not say that he was pro-abortion. I'm pro-choice, I'm pro-well, you're pro-abortion. No, no, no. He couldn't bring himself to say that he was pro-abortion, which it just showed. It's like, wait a minute. If you can't say that word, something inside of you is telling there's a problem. And so when we look at somebody who holds to it and says, well, I agree with this, and so I have to take every tenet of it far down, even if it means, well, that baby's born alive, but it just, it just, she didn't want it, so it just needs to sit there and die. Don't feed it. Don't do anything. And it's just like, that's barbaric. But they're an ideological captive. Uh, for this uh, third or fourth wave feminism that we see going on, where it's kind of like, you know, uh, well, I don't need no man. A woman doesn't need a man. And I'm just like, okay, if you take that argument all the way down, well, eventually the human race will cease to exist. You know, so it's like, wait a minute. You know, you're, you say that you're for equal rights, but you just want to destroy the society if you take it that far. Um, communism, you know, is one of these things where people look at and they're an ideological captive to it. 
where they say, you know, we must lift up the poor. And it's like, okay, this has been tried in so many places, but yet it's never worked. In fact, it's led to the deaths of thousands, perhaps millions of people. Uh, why do you think this is a good thing? Well, I agree with its core, so I must agree with everything about it. And that's, that, that's ideological captivity. Where we look at those, you may say, well, Pastor Steve, you're right, get them. We always got to look at ourselves, too. Because I would look at communi- or not communi- Calvinism as one that I look at, that I see some people who become an ideological captive to it, where they like some of the tenets of it, but then they don't realize it's like, okay, well, when you take all this back and you go all the way down this road, if you're going to hold to every single position, then God is the author of sin. You know, God is the author of people's destruction in hell. And it's like, wait a minute, he came to save people from hell, not send them to hell. And so we have to understand that sometimes, even in Christian circles, we can become ideological captives. And you say, well, that's them, Pastor Steve. Okay, denominationalism. I think that's something that people have become ideological captives to. And you say, well, that's all those others. I've had people tell me, make sure they know I was a good Southern Baptist when I pass away. Okay, I'm glad you were a good Southern Baptist. Were you a Christian? Because that's what we are first and foremost. And as a Southern Baptist, I agree, you know, Southern Baptists hold to the book, they hold to the word, and, uh, you know, and I am a Southern Baptist, but I'm a Christian far before I'm a Southern Baptist. And so we've got to always make sure that this ideological captivity does not take us as well, because what happens is ideas become a person's identity, you know, and they become this, and that's exactly what they are, and that's all they are sometimes, and that's a sad thing to see, because these ideas become that person's identity. And so the thing we always got to be prepared for as Christians when we're meeting with people like this is understanding that just as we are trying to demolish the argument, we're not trying to demolish the person. You know, in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know, the book talked about that these people are in bondage, and it is not usually because they chose to be. Now, you might say, wait a minute, they went to that march, they did that, and I agree with you. But I don't think that they sit there and said, I want to be bondage to this idea. You know, and suddenly it happens. Because there's things in our lives that we've become bondage to. And we need to say, whoa, the only thing that can set me free from this is Jesus Christ. And so we've got to remember that these folks are not the enemy. You know, even right now, we're seeing a very good picture of what ideological captivity is when it comes to the Israeli-Hamas war that's going on, where we see so many people who are clamoring, you know, for Israel's destruction. And we see this even in our in Harvard schools, where they're doing a protest. And it's like, this is Israel's fault. They're committing genocide against the Hamas people or the Palestinian people. And it's like, the Hamas was the one that killed 40 babies. Babies! And so, you know, it's it's interesting to see people getting pushback on this and suddenly, well, you know, and it's like they cannot come to say that that's wrong, even though it's obviously wrong. I don't care what your political position is. When you start killing babies, you're wrong, okay? I don't care what you believe. And so the thing is, what we've got to understand is they are ideological captives. And so instead of, you know, and and it's very hard because sometimes you just want to shake somebody, but you remember they're captive. They're captured to this idea, and so as Christians, what we need to do is help them to see the truth of the matter and the truth of what's going on versus just the ideology that they see, okay? So I've got a couple of questions for you here. Number one, how can we help ideological captives to see the truth of a situation? How can we help them to understand, hey, wait a minute, you need to really see what's going on here. And then secondly, how can we ensure that we do not become ideological captives to our positions? Okay, um, there's two, two questions are very similar. One is exterior, one's interior, okay? So y'all talk about that for just one moment, and we'll be right back.
All right. Well, I hope you had good discussion there. And I know that might have been a might have heated discussion, maybe, because there's there's a lot here that can get our blood pressure going. But when we back up, remember that all people are created in the image of God, that we were once captive to some probably some ideological uh, ideas that we don't like anymore. And we got to remember that Jesus Christ sets us free, not just from sin, but from our own ideas, from the things that we look at. And so we've got to always remember that. Now, one of the tools that people will use to try to get you to persuade you of their point, and we see this in society, is something that the book calls linguistic theft. Um, and what linguistic, linguistic theft is, is redefining words to get your way and avoid reality. And this is different than word meanings changing over time. You know, if I was in the 1920s and I said, hey, me and my best buddy, we had a gay time, you know, no one's going to think anything about it. It's going, oh, well, Steve and his friend had a happy time. They had a fun time. You know, we think about it in uh, Deck the Halls, a Christmas song, Now We Don Our Gay Apparel. You know, now saying that in 2020, in 2023, it takes on a different meaning because the word has changed. But in some ways, it is a good picture of linguistic theft. Not intentional linguistic theft, but linguistic theft nonetheless. Because we see that now we're seeing ideologies changing the meaning of words in order to get their position across. Now, some of the words that are being changed right before our eyes, what do we see? We see marriage being one. You know, it used to be a man and a, was a, man and a wife. We had the beautiful picture of the, the man dressed up in his black tuxedo or black suit and the woman in her pure white dress. Now, marriage is between anyone and everyone. It can be multiple partners. It could be the same sex. It can be uh, with a chair if you wanted to. Marriage is being changed right before us. The definition of love is being changed. You know, where all love is good. And we say, well, Steve, wait a minute. I kind of agree with all love is good. Well, here's a term coming out right now. Love knows no age. Oh, well, that's good, Steve. If, if, if that older person finds that younger person. No, love, had no, the love knows no age is coming from a group that's saying, yes, um, if I'm going to go off with an 11-year-old. Uh, so it's, it's not quite what we're looking for, but love is being changed. Hate is being changed. You know, hate used to be this, you know, I hate that, you know, I despise it, whatever. You know, hate is now being turned into any disagreement is hate. If I don't agree with your position, suddenly it's hate. And it's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, I, I can disagree with you. No, you can't. You hate me then. Equality is being changed. You know, everyone must have the same outcome. You know, it's like, well, wait a minute, I worked harder than that person. Well, you should have the same, the person who didn't work should have the same outcome that you have. That, that's not right. Well, that's not equal then. How is that not equal? You know, you put in what you put out, you know, something like that. Uh, we see this one, which is blowing our minds, uh, male and female. You know, these are just social constructs now. Don't worry about biology. Social constructs only now. Tolerance. Tolerance is a word that's being said that you must believe everything about my opinion. You know, my opinion or my position, which can be your opinion at the same time. You know, everything about my position, you must believe everything. This kind of goes back to that ideological captivity. You know, if you don't believe everything, then you're not really part of it. You know, you saw this with, um, you know, some of this, the BLM movements. That was all my, you know, if you didn't speak up, if you didn't say something, that's violence. It was like, whoa, you know, wait a minute. You know, I, I don't have to, you know, say this. And it was just, it was unreal. Uh, but, but the whole thing about it, you're, if you don't do that tolerance, then you're obviously, the next word, you're a bigot. And bigotry is now a word that's being changed to if you disagree with anything that I believe. You disagree with anything, you're a something phobe. You know, you are a, a bigot. You obviously are worse than Hitler. And so it's just like, wow. And so what happens is people are trying to control the meaning of words. Because when you control the meaning of words, what happens? Then you control the narrative. You know, and how does this linguistic theft work? How does it shape the narrative? Well, one of the ways, and we'll look at a few things here, one of the ways it shapes the narrative, it stops discussion in its tracks. You know, if, if you're trying to debate somebody, if you're having a discussion about a thing where it's like, well, you know, I don't, I, you know, I don't believe that homosexual rights, you know, I don't believe that they should have more than anyone else. Well, it's very simple. They just say, well, you're a, you're a homophobe, you know, or you're a racist or you're a, a, a sexist. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I just disagree with you. But here's the thing. It stops the discussion in my tracks. You know, how many times have we seen, you know, someone from Hollywood or a public official who, you know, disagrees with an idea and suddenly come, well, you're just racist then, and suddenly there is, or you're anti-gay, you're anti-LGBT. And so what happens is they come back with a, an apology video later. 
And it's like, okay, well, that group won. They shut you up. Even though you might have had a valid point, they shut you up because they said, well, you're something phobe. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm not. I just disagree. But linguistic theft stops discussion. Linguistic theft also compels people to act without thinking through the issues. You know, we see this, unfortunately, every time there is a, a, a shooting. Every time there's a shooting, what happens? We need gun control. We need gun control now. We don't have time to think. We don't have time to pray about this. We must act now. Do something now. You know, and it's one of these things where we're like, whoa, wait a minute. We need to think about this. We don't have time to think. And if you say that we have time to think, you must be a gun freak. You know, it's like, wait a minute. Let's slow down and really think about this. But no, no, linguistic theft says, no, we don't have time to think about this. We need to get gone. Um, another thing that it does is linguistic theft blurs the details. And what it means by that, in the book she talked about in the March for Women 2017, you know, this was a, a huge march in, I believe, Washington, and it was all for all kinds of things. It was really a hodgepodge of everything that was just kind of thrown together. And she talked about how there were people going to these marches, women going to the march, who when they got there, they were like, I'm not for that. I'm not for that either. You know, they just had heard, this is for women. This is for women's rights. And then they showed up, and it's like for men who think they're women's rights and for abortion and all these things. And there's women like, wait a minute, I don't agree with that. Uh, there were some, she mentioned that there's some women who called her and said, I wasn't sure what it was about. You know, I just went. And so linguistic theft tries to blur the, the, the details. You know, it's not pro-abortion. It's pro-choice. You know, don't, don't think about abortion. Think pro-choice. You know, you see this going on right now because that, that polled very poorly. Uh, and so what happened is you see that um, even some advocates for abortion are changing it and saying it's reproductive rights. Don't say pro-choice. That's even turned into a negative. Pro-abortion's always been a negative. So re say reproductive rights. Don't say abortion. Don't say pro-choice. Say uh, reproduction rights. Check out your news and you'll see that. But it blurs the details. It keeps us, you know, reproductive rights, that sounds like a good thing. You know, abortion sounds like a bad thing. So linguistic theft blurs the details, okay? The second thing, or excuse me, the fourth thing, is that linguistic theft vilifies the opposing viewpoint. You know, everyone wants to look like the good guy. You know, my side is the side of virtue and goodness and, and great things. And so what starts happening is the other people are bad. And so um, I, I, one of the uh, viewpoint or one of the illustrations they used was a, a, a protest on um, a college campus saying free speech was fascist. You know, and it's like, wait a minute, what, what are you talking about? It is, it, is the, uh, it, it is the antithesis of fascism to be able to speak freely. But what they knew is this, it's like free speech, which everybody would say is good. I've got to bring it down. So I'll say fascist, which everyone says is bad. And so free speech becomes fascist. And so you see how if you're for free speech, you're obviously a fascist. And it's like, wow, these don't even matter. This does not even match. But people do that. Um, Israel has made um, Gaza an apartheid state. You know, okay, Israel, Gaza, apartheid. Oh, apartheid's bad, so Israel must be bad. And it's like, wait a minute. So it's just trying to vilify the opposing viewpoint. And then there's the ever popular when somebody's really starting to lose the argument, you're worse than Hitler. You know, because everybody hates Hitler. You know, and so everybody looks at Hitler as the bad guy. And so everyone hates Hitler. And so you're worse than Hitler because of your viewpoint. And so it just shuts it down because it's like, okay, you know, you're on Hitler's side. I don't need to listen to you. Whoa, wait a minute. We just disagree. Um, the fifth thing, it turns a negative into a positive or vice versa. And I kind of let the cat out of the bag on that, you know, where it's pro-choice, not pro-abortion. Or more to the point now, it's, it's reproductive rights, not pro-abortion. You know, it's turning that negative view into a positive. You know, everybody's for reproductive rights. Nobody should tell, you know, somebody how to reproduce. Abortion, oh, yeah, abortion bad, but reproductive rights is good. You know, and the thing is, but the thing is we, we need to always remember that too, um, how it can affect us. You know, because we we see people in Christian circles who when they talk about the gospel, they want to talk about gospel being love and forgiveness, and that's it. They don't want to say anything about repentance or turning from your sins. You know, it's like, wait a minute, you can still live your life however you want to. You can still be in, you know, lifestyles that are not godly just make because God is love. God is love, God is forgiveness, and that's all he is. Now, God calls us to repent of our sins. And so we can see how this turning a negative into positive can even seep into the Christian circles. 
Well, one of the things that is also used when linguistic theft is repet repetitiveness. You know, you must use this over and over and over and over and over. Don't let people say, don't you mean this? No, I mean this. You know, again, and, and forgive it for being right on my mind, but I saw this uh, yesterday. You know, the idea about don't say pro-choice, don't say pro-abortion, say reproductive rights. And send that memo to the news cycle, send that news. Because the reason that we found this out was the, the video I was watching, um, the lady who was there was actually in the training by Planned Parenthood that said this. You know, in everything that you send out, everything you say, say reproductive rights, reproductive rights, reproductive rights. Because if we can repeat that and repeat that and repeat that, then people will start seeing it that way. And, you know, and that's the thing that's so sad about this is we see this because repetition can be a good tool. We use it for study. You know, I, hey, keep doing those math problems, Ryan. But the thing is, it's also useful for pushing agendas when people start to just say, you know, hey, we're going to do this and keep doing it. So why are words so important, though? I mean, words are important because it changes the thought process. It changes people's opinion about it. But one other thing, too, is that words are under attack because God is under attack. You know, when we look at it, you're going to answer a question about this in just a minute. We need to understand, how do we understand about God? We understand God through words. We understand his will through words. We understand his uh, purpose in our lives through the word of God. And so we see that words are something that people look at and say they need to control the words in order to change the narrative. Okay? So I know that was a long section. We've got a couple of questions for you here. Uh, number one. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What does Christ as the Word tell us about the importance of words? When we look at that scripture and it talks about the Word, man, we know words are important. If Christ is described as this, how does that show us the importance of words? The second one, explain what can happen to children who have been raised to respect authority when words are smuggled into incorrect categories. You know, when you have teachers, when you have people in authority who are now saying, oh, no, reproductive rights, not pro-choice. Reproductive rights, not this. You know, or other things about, you know, oh, well, love is, you know, anyone. Love, is, love knows no age. You know, how can this be detrimental to children when they're hearing it from authority figures, okay? And the last one, list one positive and one negative outcome of repetition from your own life, okay? So y'all talk about that for just a minute, and we'll be right back with our next segment. All right. Well, I know that was a long segment there, and I hope that you had took time to do those discussions or just to think through what was being said there, uh, because we see a lot of that linguistic theft going on in our world. Well, one of the last things that we're going to talk about in this segment or this, uh, this uh, video is going to be the idea of living my truth. 
you know, we're seeing this more and more, and you're hearing that linguistic word come out, or that phrase come into our being when it's talking about, I'm just living my truth. I'm living my truth. Well, when it comes to truth, what do we know about truth? As Christians, we know in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so when we look at the scripture, <clears throat> excuse me, what do we understand? That Jesus is truth. You know, as a kid, and when I first got exposed to the scripture, I always found that interesting to talk about. You know, because I am the way, the way of life. That was easy. You know, and then the life, he's the life that we are to live. But the truth, that was an interesting uh, one to get to. But people are always looking for truth. They want to know what is true, what is false. Well, that's why in our world, so much of culture is trying to say, well, there is no truth. The truth is what you want to make of it. But the problem is truth can be a very pesky thing. You know, as my math teacher, you know, <laughs> when I would turn in my math problems, there was suddenly a truth there because in math, there's only one correct answer to a problem. There's not multiple correct, you know, there's not multiple answers to a problem. There is only one answer. Two plus two equals four. But the problem is we're going into a society that wants to change that. It says two plus two equals five. And it was one of the most amazing videos. I remember watching a video years ago. Well, not years ago, not too long ago where it was on a college campus, and the person who was doing it, it was a Christian podcast, and he was talking to people at the college campus. And he really wanted to get past this. He wanted to talk about truth and how we see truth in God and how truth in God shows who God is and things of that nature. And so he wanted to give them the illustration, you know, that there is absolute truth. And so he said, what is two plus two? Here is a college student a student who is going to university, a college student who is studying to be a future leader of America, who is like, well, and it's just like, you could see everyone's kind of taken back, like, what? And he went into this long explanation to try to figure out how two plus two did not equal four. It equaled whatever you wanted it to be. And it was just amazing to see this because even in the video, the guy's like, wow, I wasn't even going to talk about this, but we got to talk about this now. But here's the thing. Truth is something that cannot be gotten around. Truth is what it is. Truth is absolute. However, if I want to change that, if I want to get around it, what do I got to do? I got to destroy what truth is. I've got to destroy what truth is. I've got to stop truth being object, um, ob objective, and I've got to make truth subjective. It's not concrete. It's something that I can make around and, and I can change it. You know, I can say that all truths are equal. Well, unless it disagrees with mine, which makes no sense. That makes no sense that I could have a truth that would differ from someone else's truth. You know, and, and it's one of these things that people always kind of come back to. It's like, okay, well, if, if your truth is correct, then Hitler's truth was correct. So is it okay to kill people because they're different than you? Well, of course not. Well, how can you say that if it's not truth? Well, because I don't think that way. Well, who cares what you think? Truth is. You know, and so it's just one of these things that gets crazy and it makes no sense. But again, it also shows us, again, that point of ideological captivity. That, yes, everyone's truth is equal, even Hitler's, even though Hitler's isn't. And it's just like, that's crazy. And we see things like this today. We see the lie. A man is a woman simply by saying it. Okay, th that's, that's not true. You know, what is the truth? A man can wear a dress. He can put on makeup. He can do lipstick. He can change his body to look like a female, but he cannot change his chromosomes. He is a male. That's all there is to it. But we see a world that says, oh, no, no, the truth is absolutely whatever you want it to be. Well, the problem is, I think what this happens is this feeds into our natural inclination to reject God. We are sinful. We're sinful from our birth, and we seek to reject God. But the thing is, we know that God has written himself upon our heart. Our hearts clamor for God. Our hearts desire God. So what happens? It, well, if we're going to say, nope, I'm not going to do what God says, I make myself God. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'll live my life how I want to live my life. I will direct it the way I choose to direct it. And so I make myself God. We saw this with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve tried it. Here they had everything that they could possibly have. Every, you know, every kind of happiness that they were going to deal with, every kind of fulfillment that they could possibly have. And so what did they do? They were like, you know what? Everything's wonderful, but I want to be in charge. I want to be in charge. That's why when she took the fruit, it was pleasing and good for knowledge. That's what she looked for. She wanted to be what God was. And there's Adam right along with her saying, yep, sounds good to me too. And so there's the problem. 
when we want to reject truth, we're truly rejecting God. We're truly rejecting what he is telling us to do. And we've got to remember that. Because in order to understand the world, we've got to understand that God is truth. When we can see that God is a creator, God is the one who did this, God has put certain things upon our hearts that direct us, such as morals, such as, uh, you know, seeing that all these things, there, there's no society in our world that says murder and rape is good. Where did that come from? From cultural understanding? No, it came because that morality was written upon our heart, written by the creator who put truth into us, and there is absolute truth. And so we've got to remember that. And remember that if we are going to do what we're doing in our world, it comes to worshiping God. Because in John 4, 24, what does it say? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Yes, we worship in spirit. We surrender to him. We acknowledge him. We know that it touches us on a spiritual level, but also on an intellectual level it touches us with truth. Because he is the truth. He is the one who created this. And so we see truth under attack because when truth can be made by whoever, then again, they control the narrative and they can make whatever they want. So we've got to teach our kids that God is truth, that what God says is what is right and what we should be doing. Okay, got two questions for you here. Why do you think truth is necessary for biblical love and a biblical worldview? Why is truth so necessary for those things? And then secondly, how does a false definition of love, i.e. celebrating every person's gender or sexual preference, damaging to a person's Christian worldview? All right? So y'all talk about that for just a moment. We'll be right back with our final segment. All right. Well, I know this is this is not the easiest of lessons. You know, it's one of those things that we walk through, and we know that hey, we're going to be coming into conflict with culture, but you know, that's what Jesus told us. You know, if the world loves you, it's because you're part of the world. You know, if, if you're not part of the world, if you're following God, the world's going to hate you. Look at what it did to him. And so, the thing we've got to be very wary of is to look at these things. And again, and I do want to reiterate, reemphasize this is that people who hold to these things, people who are engaging in linguistic theft, people who are, you know, about trying to redefine truth, you know, and do those things, and people, they are ideological captives, and they are not the enemy. They may be used by the enemy, but it's not the enemy of the other political party. It's the enemy of all creation and all humanity, and that's Satan. He wants to see us divide. You know, we talk about it in our world, oh, our country is so divided. Our world is so divided, and it's always been that way. It's divided by those who are going to follow Christ and those who reject Christ. That's the division. 
And so what we've got to always understand is all of these things are residual. All of these things are secondary to the primary division. The division of Jesus Christ versus rejecting Jesus Christ. And all of these things, living their truth, um, linguistic theft, feeds into that. Feeds into that purpose of saying, reject Christ, reject the truth, reject who he is. And as Christians, we are not their enemy. We are the ones who should be there telling them, here's the truth. And how do we do that? We learn about these things. These aren't things I'm just throwing out there for you to sit there and say, that's right. Get them, Pastor Steve. No, it's for us to use these things to see and to understand, hey, we need to tell people about Jesus Christ. And when they're focused on living their truth, we need to be able to tell you, no, there is a truth in Jesus Christ. When they're trying to change the meaning of words, you know, we see this in Christianity. Oh, well, God is love, so that means God loves everybody. That means God is okay with everything. That means that even the atheist, God is going to let into heaven because God is love. That is absolutely wrong. Okay, if you're out there and you fall under that false assumption, uh, you know, does God love you? Yes, God loves all his children. God created every single one of us. But if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, guess what? You will not be with him for eternity. If you have rejected him, then God will give you what you desire and you will be separated from him for eternity. And the thing about it is this, as a Christian, I am to tell you this. I'm to confront you to say that there is truth. That there is an absolute truth. And there is Jesus Christ dying on the cross to save us from our sins. That whoever puts their faith and trust in him, they will be saved. And that's the truth. And so what we've got to do is understand that we live in a very messy world. It's a very messy world. But it's not because of the people. It's because of the ideology behind it. It's because of Satan who's twisting and who's turning and who's trying to keep people from seeing the truth of Jesus Christ, who wants to keep us shut up, who would say, yeah, shut up, you Christian, you something-phobe. Okay, call me a something-phobe, but I'm still going to give you the truth because that's the most loving thing I can do, to agree with somebody just to say, oh, well, they, they think I'm tolerant, and not, and not to give them the truth. That's hate. That is what hate is. How much do we have to hate somebody that we would not tell them the gospel, that we wouldn't give them the truth, that we'd sit there and say, oh, well, you're a mean person, so guess what? You can just go to hell then. And that's the thing we've got to be very wary of in our lives is that we just sit there and we just sit back and say, well, they're mean. They live a different lifestyle. They belittle my position. They make fun of Christ. Okay, maybe we didn't do some of those things before we met Christ. Maybe we did. Okay, let's be honest with ourselves. Maybe we did, and yet Jesus Christ saved us, didn't he? When we turned our heart towards him, when he touched our hearts and he drew us and we went and we accepted and we turned from our sins, guess what? He saved us, and he can do that to everybody else too. He can do that to the ideological captive. He can do that to the one who's changing linguistic theft or engaged in linguistic theft. He can do that to those who reject his truth, and we are the bearers of that message. So let us bear that message first and foremost to our family because that's the whole point of Mama Bear Apologetics. But let us promote that to our families, promote it to our friends, promote it to our coworkers, promote it to those who are around us so that they might see the truth of who Jesus Christ is. All right? Let's have a word. Dear Father God, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we look at this and it, and it gets upsetting. We look at this and we see our world and we, we see all of this on our news. We see it in our, our college campuses. We see it all over the world. And Lord, help us as Christians to not get caught up in it and to always understand the, the core of where this comes from. It comes from Satan. It comes from that desire to change the truth. It comes from that desire to change the meaning of words in order to knock Christ down in order to keep people from coming to know him as the word, as Lord, as Savior. So Lord, help us as Christians that our heart would remain soft, that our heart would remain soft to those who we disagree with, that our hearts would remain soft towards those who may hold positions that we are so diametrically opposed to. But Lord, that we would still remember and see that they're captives, just as we were captives you set us free. Let us give them the gospel so that they might receive freedom. That they might know that, yeah, I might disagree with you, but I'm still going to talk to you. 
I'm not going to resort to name calling. I'm not going to resort to anger and bitterness. I'm not going to resort to, to, to being mean. But I'm just going to give you the love, the love that Christ gave me. So Lord, help us to always make sure that we don't fall into these categories, that we don't fall into you know, linguistic theft, trying to make words mean something that they don't truly mean, that we would not become captive to an ideology, but Lord, that we would only become captive to you, that we would become captive to what you told us, the truth of who you are, not the truth of what we want you to be, because Lord, our truth is no truth at all. Lord, help us to always remember that these folks that we're going to meet, these people who might make our blood boil, Lord, they were created in your image, and you died on the cross for each one of them, that if they would put their faith and trust in you, they would be saved. So, Lord, help us to have tender hearts, to be able to be quick to listen, slow to anger, and slow to speak. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that y'all will, uh, you know, continue watching and looking into this message as we're going to continue on next week with it. I do again want to give a little bit of a little bit of a warning. It's going to touch some very sensitive topics, as you've seen tonight. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about some social justice issues and things like that. So there's going to be some some issues and some sensitive things we talk about. So I want you to be prepared for it as we go through this lesson. But again, I think it's a very important lesson that we look at. We talk about and we teach our children how to deal with the culture, how to be able to show a Christian witness to a culture that wants to th shut it down so much. But again, thank you for joining us, and I hope you'll see us again next week.